Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, is it can loud enough? Yeah. yeah, it's good. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to um, warn you that I have quite a large number of slides <laughs> that I've hoarded over the years. And um, so it's going to be a little bit like a photo family album kind of thing that I'm just going to flip through and then stop occasionally to talk about um, certain things. Um, so, first of all, um, is this question um, that how I got to where I am in Greenside Farm. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a mystery, and I like this quote, this idea that somehow um, we have to question uh, why we are where we end up being, and that's important. And um, what I'm going to present uh, today, just a kind of in general, um, that I've, you know, these are all the uh, colleagues of mine, places I've taught in the last, it, the, the last five years, and um, these are, put, I put down all the names of the tutors that I've worked with, and over the years, uh, these are the number of students that have been uh, at the farm, and I'm not going to be able to name every single one of them, but I just wanted to let you know that what you're seeing is basically a very, a collection of work that are done by students of mine, uh, some of them myself, um, some also in collaboration with um, um, uh, the local uh, people around the farm. So first of all, just very quickly, um, the, um, so this is a map of London, and we are just northwest of um, London, about uh, 50 minutes away by car, and that's what it looks like, an aerial view. And that's the um, extent of the property. Um, in the 19th century, this working farm used to be much larger, and it's been, since been subdivided into pieces. And, and we have this funny-shaped part uh, that's sort of in between the manor house and um, some barns. So in spring 2004, uh, we arrived at the farm, and my partner and I um, uh, bought the property as a way to prepare for maybe future retirement, but also a place to work for the time being. And also, it became um, a subject or the background of my PhD research. So the place was... Uh, pretty neglected, there was a lot of diseased uh, plants and overgrown um, patches of land and just um, basically a lot of the buildings were dilapidated and one of the things we had to do at the beginning was to um, just tidy up. And for my PhD, I, the question I asked myself from the very beginning is I wanted to link casting and architecture. When I say casting here, I mean co-casting um, for the purpose of the PhD. Um, and I ended up using uh, photography as a way to link the two, as a way to talk about both and together. And this is, a, uh, for, uh, this is the oriel window of Le Coq Abbey, um, taken by the first successful image taken with a camera by William Henry Fox Talbot. Uh, but it's technically a negative. He's the, Henry Fox Talbot is the uh, British um, kind of inventor of photography, and his process is the one that uh, actually lasted much longer than the French uh, version of the inventor of photographer, photography, which is uh, Louis Daguerre, which is the daguerreotype. So this is a positive-negative process, so with this, you know, the actual image can be created. But what is really interesting for me is that the, the images that were created, or his struggle in creating an image, wasn't, just, wasn't about trying to create an image itself, but it's about how to fix it. He wasn't able to fix it. 
uh, at the, for a long time, he was able to create the images. The the they knew what was what the, the chemicals that they required to, to 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 create the images, but they were not able to fix um, the images. And there is a, a very interesting quote by the um, uh, in the correspondence between Henry Fox Talbot and his sister-in-law. Laura Mundy. She said, I've grieved over the gradual disappearance of those you gave me in the summer and am delighted to have these to supply their place in my book. So the, the, the idea that the, photog the images that were created were actually just temporary, they would fade away after several months, it was very interesting. And it was this struggle that I thought made the really interesting link interesting link between architecture and casting. So I tried to find a way to, 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 to bring the three together and, and that came when I saw um, this particular project that was uh, commissioned by um, the South Kensington Museum, which is a V&A now, uh, of the, um, um, Basically, the South Kensington Museum commissioned Thurston Thompson and Domenico Bruciani to photograph and cast this, uh, the Porto de la Gloria of the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela. So this is the photograph that was taken by um, Thurston Thompson in 1867, and this was the cast that Luciani brought back and is now still at the, in the V&A. So together, the cast and the photograph were um, com complementary to each other. They were meant to together be able to tell the story of this uh, doorway. And the cast itself was not enough, and the photograph itself was not enough, but together they were um, shown. And I found another interesting example here, Hertz of Tomorrow's, uh, in casting of the, the uh, Abel Wells, the library in outside Berlin. Um, a, a retardant is silk screened onto a piece of uh, cast concrete, and then it's the, the, not, the, the bit of concrete that's not set, cement that's not set, is washed away, creating images. And you can see today, the texture of these images are uh, really quite uh, inviting. If you look closely, um, this is what they look like. So the bit that are set uh, is, the one, is the smooth part, and then the rough part is the one that's been washed away. But if you look at the same image throughout the building, you'll see that they are slowly still fading away. And I, I, um, I wanted to draw this. Um, this um, idea as a kind of a struggle about trying to fix something. So back uh, to the farm. Um, I first occupied this uh, little outbuilding and um, I call it uh, room one. And within it, I've made a lot of uh, casts with fabric formwork and I cast uh, dry plus uh, dry cement with sand, and I would spray them slowly over time to allow them to set, to be able to fix the shape. And this uh, various experiment over time just um, started to inhabit this room. And also outside. Um, uh, there was other kind of growings uh, happening at the same time. Uh, I had my friends, uh, for, uh, Mark and Sonia, to help me uh, to, to work on the garden. And uh, for the, for this is a, this is a cast of, uh, this is the mole for creating the, the uh, roof pieces for the Palazzetto della Sport uh, by Nervi. And I'm interested in this idea that a piece of the dome was created in order for the mole to be, uh, to be created uh, in order to cast all the multiple pieces that create the dome. So this is another aspect of uh, casting that I was looking at, this idea of the kind of the, 
uh, how you, you the, the, the cast makes many copies just like uh, the uh, photograph. And um, a few years passed and um, what, what I was um, basically doing was try basically, you know, uh, uh, repair the, the, the outbuildings and trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, create the, you know, make space for the workshop. But um, in the end, I decided that uh, what I wanted to do was introduce something else, something that, uh, something that uh, another kind of uh, tool that will allow me to examine the, the relationship between um, photography and casting. And I thought um, it's going to be a digital tool. And this idea that I'm going to use a CNC machine to, to, um, to uh, explore um, the idea of how you make a mold. Because in a digital model, you don't have a positive negative shape because you can rotate the model you know one way it's negative you look at it the other way it's a positive so I thought this is a really interesting idea um, to to um, to study uh, um, the uh, for, um, mold making so the series of molds that uh, that uh, were created to create a series of tessellated um, uh, tiles, and this is inspired by the um, Nervi's piece that um, instead of a dome, it's a cylinder. And here you have six pieces, uh, six uh, repeated pieces that uh, come together to form a ring that is uh, a cylinder that is not periodical. It's based on Penrose's um, a tiling uh, um, geometry. So here is just the design of the mold and how the molds are subdivided, laid it into flat sheets of polystyrene, cut and assembled together to um, for to create, to create the molds. So here you have all the pieces that were cast so that's what the and then in the end it was uh, uh, put together as an exhibition in at the Bartlett so this was a second part of um, my uh, um, uh, PhD work but um, at the time, I worked uh, for, for this particular project. I worked with um, a friend of mine, and we had plans to use this project as a way to create a, to start a practice together, and you know, but uh, that didn't work out in the end, and it was devastating. So, um, yeah. So that. Uh, that was really, really difficult, and I had to find a way to conclude the PhD because I thought that piece I've done was, um, you know, uh, uh, was a way I was going to wrap up the PhD and move on. But uh, it was not to be, so I had to make another piece of work because I couldn't end, I didn't want to end the PhD with that piece. So I uh, created a new project. I got my aunt and I dug a really big hole, <laughs> and I put her in it. <laughs> and this is, uh, together with the photograph, I also looked at how, this, so this is a, a you call a rashes, I suppose. It's not edited, it's just something that is one of the footage that I have, and I've never shown this before because uh, it's the, the, the film, the, the, the rashes are then cut into, um, I, into a, a short film. But here, all you're seeing is a device that I've created to go in and out of the hole. Um, so, that winter was particularly cold and depressing. But uh, I had to find a way out of this, and I spent some time just 
finish writing the PhD and think of ways to move forward. So uh, just by chance, a group of students from the RCA approached me and say, um, if I can help them build um, something with my CNC machine. So they came and they spent some time uh, uh, on the farm working. And then another uh, couple of young graduates whom uh, helped me with the construction of the ring approached me to say, well, we have a small building we would like to build using the CNC machine. So I did that. And together, these uh, two projects made me realize, actually, there's something really interesting about um, you know, this way of working. So I thought, perhaps, um, um, that's something I can do. And luckily, uh, I was uh, offered a couple of uh, possibility to, to teach a studio, to co-teach a studio, both at the Bartlett and University of Westminster. So I, um, I, took, I, I decided that I'll incorporate the farm somehow into my teaching. So it's this, this quote that I, I really liked, uh, and I wanted to use it as a kind of idea for how the studio would be, uh, would, would be taught. So somehow this idea that um, uh, the process of making is somehow visible um, you know, in, the, in the finished building. And I went to the estate where he worked, where he built most of his building. As you can see here at the back, this, this is, they arranged the, the bricks, the, the fire the bricks, and you can see here that they're darker on one side and it's lighter on the other side. It's just because the heat's not evenly distributed, so the, the bricks are fired differently at the, the different parts of the, 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 the block. So they use the brick differently according to the strength. And this is a more, uh, this is a project from this, a student of mine this year, he made a tool with rebar that when you roll it onto a piece of clay, it creates the most wonderful texture. Um, somehow I feel like these two, two things, uh, for me, it talks about the kind of studio that, uh, that I, I, I wanted to, 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 to create at the farm. And I tried to combine my knowledge in digital fabrication with my interest in site-specific work. So I proposed to both university for students to work at a farm as part of their studio work, and they would do something site-specific. So here, this is the, the first group of students um, enjoying themselves, working day, night, digging, casting, uh, making fire, and yeah, it was, really nice. They spend uh, nights uh, working with bits. They realized that, you know, the CNC can, machine can cut all the pieces, but it will still take them hours and hours and hours to sand the edges. So that's what they, these uh, two were doing. And what they are doing is they're creating a screen that is uh, used for the, to, to, to shade the, the main uh, at glass uh, doors to the living room area. And this is what it looks like at night, during the day. The details, all the little pieces that uh, uh, you saw them sanding. And you can see little white parts that uh, basically um, there are lots of, uh, let's say, not so accurate bits of the, the cutting uh, due to um, the, the limitation of the, the size of the pieces. And um, so what is interesting is that the student would, uh, would make something one-to-one -one and they have to assemble it on site. And while doing that, they, um, they take with them all the little um, uh, difficulties that they encounter as, uh, as part of the project. And climbing out of the window with quite dangerous looking act over there. And some of the students take on some of my uh, ideas about um, casting and camera and this student created a pinhole camera but using cast pieces of plaster uh, as, a, as, a, as the object that would capture the image in the landscape. So they would take the camera, load the the plaster that's been uh, coated with a light sensitive 
uh, material will drive to the position where they want the pictures to be taken, expose it, drive it back to a room where they've completely sealed the windows as a dark room to, um, to, to expose. And of all the pieces, only one tiny little tree that you see there came out as anything close to what you can call an image. <laughs> um, the rest were just black. And just more family album style photographs. Um, but casting is a big part of uh, what the students were doing, so um, casting in all kinds of way, playing with plaster. Um, in this case, uh, so here, this is the first year, and no, this, that was the first group, and then in, in order to, to, in, um, to, to, allow, to have the student to have more access to something that they can do directly, we uh, have the laser cutter, we have a 3D printer, and also we extend, expanded the, the workshop and uh, took, up, took up all the walls in between and allowed for the students to have more space to work. And this is a group of students making um, kind of a, a sculptural piece uh, that are made from just CNC foam looking at texture of, uh, that would migrate from one student to the other. So this is texture created by all the different students, but um, the, they will have neighbors and they will try to negotiate how the texture would change from one to the other. And we would have a crit there and um, as a kind of conclusion to the project. And that year also, uh, that summer, uh, Anne brought a uh, studio to Rome, and from Rome they also uh, came to the farm. And they found the clay on, underneath the farm particularly interesting, and they played with that a lot. And the project was to create two, two, uh, two staircases. One was sited in the kind of in between the workshop and living area, and the other was created inside the workshop, going into the dorm. So, so this staircase will lead to the, the place where um, eventually became a kind of dormitory. So this is then another year. So this year, the student decided that they are going to take the uh, disuse um, um, uh, greenhouses and turn it into a big uh, table for a banquet. So it has six huge um, barbecue pit and three tons of concrete and a not very successful roof, this one, uh, because in the end, it, uh, it, uh, they weren't able to finish the, the roof, and it rained, of course, because of that. So, um, so this is it, and they were rewarded uh, with this. And, um, but, for example, within this one year that really nice plywood screen that you saw earlier it turned into this. So another student decided that he was going to replace this with one that will perhaps last a little longer. So he decided he was going to look at how to make a screen out of bent metal. And by using all the different techniques uh, and also tools that are available at the farm, for example, using the 3D printer to create details, to join and then cast them, uh, in order to create very specific uh, connections between the pieces of metal, uh, he was able to uh, put together a, a rather a solid screen that worked really well and is still there. So he, here I'm just showing you pictures of all the various parts that uh, he had created in order to assemble this metal screen. So this is what it looks like from the outside from the inside, and you can see how the details that are 3D printed uh, fit really snugly uh, to, the, to the metal screen. 
And this is a kind, this is a, uh, an example of something that would have been a very uh, costly uh, uh, production that in the past we are able to do this uh, with the help of uh, the 3D printer. So the 3D printer and the CNC machine are, are used in such a way that they, they are used to make something that's uh, a one-to-one. -one. Uh, they, they perform a very specific way in terms of geometry. It's not about uh, necessarily just about the shape, but how they come together. So um, that year was also the Olympics uh, in London, so we helped build uh, this uh, sculpture. And, but at the end, they, um, this, the, 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 the flags were meant to be given away to all the delegates, but in the end, they didn't want the flags, so we took them back and we built a staircase to replace the one, unfortunately, built by the students from the Waterloo. <laughs> just not because it was, it's just because uh, it, was, uh, it was really difficult to go up and down that really curvy bit of the stairs. So this one is a little bit more practical. So uh, with these uh, more and as, as the as the year this was this was by then the, the second year running the workshop so um, more people coming and the sleeping arrangement has to be better a bigger kitchen a, a, a more just I had to make a lot of practical adjustments to the farm so that you know we have fire doors we have you know, places that are safe for the students to spend, you know, long hours uh, at. And I, I, you know, I wanted the place to be able to function the, the way um, that I, I had imagined um, and, and not to be, to be bogged down by all the practicalities. But anyway, there are lots of little things that, you know, just that we had to deal with. So we also, what we, what we decided to do was then to, for example, this is the kitchen. So we decided to use the kit, the, uh, what, we, what we've learned, what, we, um, what we've, uh, tr uh, for example, our, our know-how in casting to make the sink. We cast all the pieces of the tiles. And we're trying to um, use, uh, to, to make pieces um, that, uh, that can actually be uh, incorporated into the architecture of the farm itself. So really large scale mold um, to cast the concrete sink. And these are tiles that are slip cast with, um, this is, uh, the geometry is called a pinwheel. It's also a, a periodical uh, pattern, uh, which means that it's very specific in, way, in terms of how it's meant to fit, come together which means that by the, you, by the time you get to the end, you can, if, we weren't sure if we were able to cut the tile, so we make all the specific one as well. So the unique pieces are not difficult to make, it's just a matter of uh, you know, making uh, an extra mold. We also t uh, tested the glaze, and in the end, the glaze was a bit crazy. And you can see, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it, it crazed everywhere here. Yeah because um, we, th we didn't expect the, 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 the process of finally putting it onto the wall and then when we washed it after the, uh, putting the, uh, the grout on, it just started to, this little fine uh, texture just appeared and it's just everywhere. And I learned something new. I didn't know, maybe I should have, but it's basically called crazes. And so then the molds are put aside on shelves. Uh, perhaps one day, if one of the tiles are broken, we can use, them, uh, use it again to, 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 to cast another piece. So here, then the, uh, we made a series of bunk beds for the students here. On top of the workshop, we have eight bunk beds. Each one has a specially cast uh, light. Um, so but apart from that also, the, we use the 3D printer to also, I continue to look at this idea of what the 3D printer means in terms of casting. So I try to make objects that are almost impossible to cast using uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 3D printer. Look at geometries that are, this is based on um, the radio ralia and it has, 
an internal surface that you know the, if you if you make a traditional mold, it just would never be able to come out. And uh, so that was uh, for a, um, a proposal for VNA, and then this and this one is for. Um, <coughs> the FRAC Center together with uh, Marcos and Marian uh, in Orléans. So looking at uh, specifically about how two paths are created uh, to give the, the object uh, its own texture, that is not something you model. You, don't, you can't model this shape. These shapes are created by the two path itself. So then uh, that summer, uh, Samantha uh, Oswald from the Waterloo went back and asked if she could um, build something at the farm. And she spent, uh, eventually she spent two, two summers taking out the clay and uh, similar to the process that I was doing uh, with the hole, would take out the clay, take out the flint, uh, um, sift them, uh, process them so that they can be cast into bricks. It's a really, really amazing uh, process. And uh, she was just really incredible student and like a machine. She was working long hours and just really amazingly determined. And, and this is the kind of energy that student demonstrated uh, at the farm that for me was really, really incredible. And this is what it looks like. More recently, you can see part of it's damaged on the side because horses kept rubbing against it um, to, I guess, I'm not sure why, but yeah. Um, so that year we decided, okay, it's time to, you know, to, to, to investigate further what, uh, you know, what are the kinds of digital tools we can use. So we decided that we're going to get a robot. So this is... Um, the robot arrived at, uh, with a pallet, so you can just about see it right there. And we have to take the pallet up from the robot, but it's not that simple because this thing, the robot weighs a couple of tons. And uh, the, only thing, the only way we could, we, dis we decided that the only way to, to lift it up with this, uh, these, these trusses and then, and then pull the, 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 um, the, the pallet out. And when the company came to install the robot, they said they have never ever seen such a primitive thing to unload a robot, which they were very impressed. And where did we get this robot from? It's, there is a little, kind of like a cemetery, oh no, sorry, it's like an orphanage, more like, <laughs> of uh, robots. Um, here, they, the retired robots go and sit in this big, great big yard that just, they looked, Kind of menacing, but at the same time, rather sad. So they, I just picked one. <laughs> it, it kind of winked at me, and I said, OK, this one. So we decided that uh, what we were going to do first was I wanted to extend the research into clay. And we said, OK, we're going to try to see if we can use the clay, uh, make a clay extruder, extruder and attach it to the robot and see if the robot could, um, could be used to, um, to, to, to make something out of. And the first, the first uh, idea was that instead of, making, uh, instead of making clay objects, we were going to make molds. So the clay are created, um, made into molds, and then it's used to cast. Uh, the object, and then the clay can be taken out and can be recycled. It seems like a really good idea. Uh, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention, um, the, this extruder that uh, the students and I put together didn't really work because we couldn't get enough pressure. And in the end, we came up with a really interesting solution, which is not to to have this extruder, just the extrusion coming out of this sausage maker and this pup mill, and that we would move the robot, the robot would move instead of the, uh, of, instead of moving the extruder. And that worked really extremely well. So we were able to make something really quick 
And only now that I discovered um, that in fact, this is in fact a really, really good solution because the, the clay that we were able to use, we could use very, very solid clay that is like almost uh, something that you would do in the industry to make extruded tiles or extruded uh, clay components. And this is what it looks like. And these are the inside of the molds. And these are the casts. And that's the biggest object that we managed to make by the end of the year. And then there's another year. So this is now students of Westminster again, back to the farm. They continue to look for places where they could intervene, small, a gate, a piece of the greenhouse, um, looking at glass, and also extending our uh, workshop to local university at Buckinghamshire University to work with the glass blower there to, uh, to, to work with the material that we were not able to, to do uh, at the farm. But the jigs, the molds were created by us, but we, the student would work with the glass blower to, um, to produce the final piece. And this is a series of components that were able to um, to control by the jig that you can see on the left side. And this is uh, uh, the making of a handle to um, the gate that was uh, falling apart that the student refurbished and uh, they use the local clay, the clay from the ground to make this uh, special paint that makes it red. And also here, um, plaster components that are joined together to make um, um, a, a wall. And so here, uh, students are constantly asking about how, if the CNC were used, machine were to use to make a mold, how can they make the mold differently? Uh, making the molds reconfigurable so they are not uh, unique. Uh, they can be moved around to create different objects. So different objects can be created from a series of molds that uh, can be uh, put together differently. So, I have a feeling that I'm going to run out of time, <laughs> but and the, uh, I'm gonna try to, to move a little bit uh, quicker. So here, uh, another year, the uh, Waterloo students were there. Uh, this year, we combined the, the workshop with uh, also a seminar, so students were making um, uh, cast on a barbecue. This is uh, Anna's uh, uh, piece uh, with uh, slip cast with uh, cardboard molds. And this is another one looking at texture of wood uh, at different scale. And, and this, is, this is then the event. It uh, culminated in a seminar where uh, we had uh, um, invited some guests to talk about you know, ideas of casting, and um, it was, yeah. So, I wanted to just now to, to, to reflect a little bit on, uh, at this point, what has, you know, what is now in the, on, in the workshop shelves. You know, some materials that on my workshop shelves at the farm have expiry dates, like food products. Plaster and cement have a shelf life, about three months, resin, 12 months and some a lot longer than others. Um, on these shelves also live a collection of physical models and material samples that will not go off anytime soon. Some I have just placed on the shelf, but as a whole, they have slowly accumulated over the last few years. These comprise successful but unwanted models, failed material experiments, successful but redundant materials experiments, used molds, molds that can be, can be used again, just sitting there waiting. Uh, we have successful molds, failed casts, samples of materials or pieces used to, for demonstrating to students about you know, mold design or to figure out tolerances or in general, just prototypes. And this is, this, uh, the, Anna's project was really, really interesting for me because she just said to me, you know, I like to try this slip cast, but I'm gonna use cardboard as mold. 
And I first thought, well, this is perhaps not a very good idea. But with trial and error, she managed. And uh, she think she took all the good ones that left me these, with these ones that are a bit wonky. But they are a very good reminder for me of the process that she went through and also this idea that, you know, it's e we, if you learn something uh, through to, to the pro process of making, sometimes you forget that um, what you learn is also very difficult to unlearn. So when engaging with students, uh, it's sometimes I try not to try, try not to think that you know whatever you know they are thinking of can or cannot work because uh, you know you have to try it because you know this is a very good example where you know in principle it sounds tricky but you know it's possible and um, I want to compare my shelves to an archive it's key to research or like this collection of moles is it's almost forgotten but perhaps one day it can be useful again and this image I have nothing to say about, but I just could not take it out. Sorry. Um, here, um, I wanted to talk about how we continue the research with the robot. So here, this is how we ended the, in the last, uh, last project with the pump here. So with the new system, what we've decided to do is to invest in the industrial pump where the pump itself uh, works uh, not with pressure, but with a, with a rotating uh, a rotary um, um, a, a dozing system. So basically, the, the, it works a little bit like a puck mill, but it's able to rotate in such a way that the clay can be, uh, can be extruded at a certain rate, and you can control it by uh, turning the rotary the other way, and it can be stopped. So what is interesting here is that if you look at a lot of the research done at the moment on clay extrusion, they are continuous path, which means that their the extrusion cannot do what ours is doing, cannot stop and move to another position. And because of that, we, because of this ability, we are trying to look at ways in which um, the geometry um, um, are designed to take advantage of this particular feature. So here is uh, an idea of perhaps making a kind of, uh, uh, making bricks that are uh, porous. Um, so when they're fired, this is what they look like. Um, it's kind of a size of a brick, but much lighter. Um, they can tessellate in uh, different ways, and this is another version of the same family of object. This is what it looks like before the firing, and this is kind of a diagram of how they uh, can be assembled. So these are all the different pieces that were created. Just to add that this clay is the same clay that uh, Samantha used. It's clay that is from our area, and it's really beautiful, uh, the orange and bright when it's fired. But this is the, 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 the rotary uh, component that controls the dosing of the clay. Within three months, um, it had eroded away so much of the, 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 the metal component that it's no longer effective. So this is a, a huge problem, which means that we're not able to use um, the clay directly from the ground because it's too uh, abrasive for the, the machine. So it's not, uh, it's not something that uh, I, 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 we still don't have a solution for that, so we are using a much smoother clay for the time being, that we will show you later on. So a, apart from just a, a normal uh, uh, making um, um, a functional uh, architecture component, we also play with uh, making our own uh, nozzle to create other kind of objects. And so 
In this section, I'm going to talk about how uh, this is a, a series of projects that we worked with the students of uh, the RCA. And what we did was we created a series of seminars with the help of uh, some funding from Daiwa Foundation to, to take students to factory in Japan to look at how, uh, the, how they work, in, in specifically here in a factory where they make uh, pre-cut CNC wooden components for houses. So how we make things is changing. New techniques in digital manufacturing are changing how we manufacture everything from our underwear to our houses. Architectural practice has been transformed to the emergence of new digital tools and construction technologies. What can we learn on the factory floor? How can we learn about architectural design through studies of crafts in making? So here, this is what it looks like in the factory uh, pre-cut factory, very specific um, um, technique. They can cut 70 houses a day. So what, we, uh, what one student did is to, um, he, she wanted to make um, a project using timber and she managed to convince uh, Hook Park to donate uh, uh, a series of timber uh, uh, for, um, for a project that uh, uh, that she designed. So this is a whole new approach again, uh, as you will see. So the, the, this timber arriving and what she's done is uh, went across the street from the farm and convinced uh, this school that uh, perhaps she could build something for them. And the idea is to look at uh, local, uh, a local factory, Urko Furniture Factory in uh, uh, Princess Risborough, just 10 minutes away from the farm. Um, so the real understanding of how materials can inform this process um, uh, is sometimes overlooked. So um, we, what, one of the ideas is to try to find a way to integrate um, local materials with um, um, uh, um, industrial processes. Um, and a larger scale. So here, uh, the various timber uh, joints experiments, and this is uh, one of the joints that she, she proposed for the uh, project, uh, for the building project. So she created um, an actually a, a visiting school at the farm, so to, so that it's a kind of farm within the farm. Like basically, she created her own kind of uh, group of students that she would then direct with the help of engineers, she invited artists, and together they built this small building, uh, or at least this is the phase one for the small building, which is a music room for children to practice music in. And we used the CNC machine to cut all the pieces, and they are joined together on site. It's a pretty remarkable project that uh, was uh, created um, only you know very little resources and only a few months. Basically, everything was done in kind. Uh, the uh, parents of students would uh, donate a digger, dug up bits of the ground. Uh, someone would come over and make cakes for the, the students working on it. And yeah, so this is what it now looks like uh, just last uh, summer. So that is the completion of phase one. So if you're interested uh, this summer, we're gonna have uh, phase two, which is uh, we, we're going to create furniture for the inside, but also produce the cladding. So if you're interested, please uh, visit. Uh, uh, you can find more information at the A Visiting School, Lacey Green. And the idea is to be able to uh, make this building fully uh, cladded so that uh, it can function uh, as the as a, as a proper classroom as, as opposed to just this um, little playground. So um, in 2014, uh, as part of uh, a research effort, I also took a group of students to, tra to Jing Dezhen, and we ventured into this economy that's more than 2,000 years old, um, founded on you know, local porcelain, which is naturally you know, superior in quality. And also the techniques that uh, they were using um, were um, almost um, disappearing within China. So uh, here, 
uh, the student uh, took uh, what, uh, what they've learned uh, in the trip and used um, a lot of the digital tools as part of uh, the techniques of create, recreating some of the things that they've seen. And here, in this particular case, it's a, a series of um, a ceramic uh, uh, lattice uh, component. So these are the molds, and this is uh, the uh, terracotta cast, slip cast. So unlike the um, traditional slip casting process where you would produce, often you would produce a positive and then you take a mold from it. All the molds are directly cut on a CNC machine and then the molds are created from that. So it's the mold of the mold, which is what you're seeing here. And it takes 12 hours uh, for the clay to sit inside this mold before you can take it out. It takes seven to 10 days sitting on the shelf to dry thoroughly before it can go into the kiln. And it takes another 24 hours for it to be fired. And this is what they look like when it's joined together from the inside looking out and from the outside looking in. And this is another student looking at a slightly different technique. And here is another mold that is thought of very strictly as a four-part mold and the texture is designed in such a way that it's meant to be read um, inside and out. I've mixed up this, it's meant to go with it earlier. So uh, this is a, a piece that uh, can be joined together, the, the component can be joined together in different ways. And what, so, the way it works with the research uh, with the clay extrusion is that one, one year the student would do something and then the next year the student would come and try to identify some of the issues and then try to uh, resolve that. So this is an issue about how all the striation in the extrusions are always horizontal. So the students sought to find a way to produce something that is not just cut horizontally but allowed to um, uh, to, to follow a contour. So the one idea is to make a polystyrene mold and then extrude it onto it. And here, they made a little test. They've created an algorithm that will allow for the pattern that this doesn't repeat. But the, it would crack because the, the shrinkage and, and the, the movement uh, when the, the clay dries. So uh, we came up with a really nice idea to borrow the idea from a slip casting. We would cast plaster molds and then extrude the, the clay onto the plaster once it's stone dry. And then it would just absorb the moisture and it would just peel off nicely. Um, and that's just, you know, it's not a technique that is uh, it's used, you know, in this way, but we borrowed it and, uh, um, as, uh, and use it uh, to, to do something completely different, which um, it was really interesting. And none of the pattern repeats. Uh, the, 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 the geometry of the component is overall is the same, but the pattern itself uh, never repeats. And the pieces are joined together, again, using traditional technique, uh, just using slip. And in order for it to be, uh, to be able to join together, we have to make customized little, uh, this is really, really excessive, basically in order to hold the pieces temporarily together. But it's really excessive because all the pieces are made in such a way that they can be removed very carefully from the holes on the side because as it shrinks, they, you, don't, you don't want it to be caught on all these wooden pieces, so they, they are almost ridiculous. Uh, ridiculously you know, uh, inefficient. But, um, yeah. So, and then we fired them, glazed them, so they managed, it, it, you know, in, in a way, we've, we managed to, uh, to you know, get to this stage, to, for, to, but there's still question about its actually its actual strength. So, 
we might uh, continue this research but using another um, clay. So I really have to speed up here. And this is, uh, this is about uh, working with uh, metal and by, it's like, it's, it's uh, karigami. So basically cutting into it and then able, and then folding it. So this is uh, folding methods that create this. This is, this is really important, the, 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 the digital stimulation part because with, with what we are trying to do is we, sometimes we have, we want to be able to understand the geometry of it before we cut it because it's really expensive to cut these uh, metal. Um, so these are paper used as a test and these are piece, all those pieces, components uh, put together. The question that was asked here initially was, can, this is uh, almost like ferro cement. It's uh, trying to create a shape that is a concrete shape that doesn't require a mold. So this, the metal sh shape would be formed and then concrete will be sprayed over it in, over time as if you are making a ferro cement object. So you're basically a mesh that you would uh, apply concrete over, over and over again. So um, this is, it's just purely shape making. And this, this year we are looking at how to um, create a kind of structural logic uh, with this technique. So year after year, we take some of the ideas um, in, from one project and we try to do it again differently or trying to explore another aspect of it. So here, this is uh, with all the different uh, uh, knowledge that we've uh, accumulated about uh, in terms of the clay's ability to extrude the angle. These are shapes that were generated based on all the information that we know about how, what the clay wants to do and doesn't want to do. And, and the shapes were basically created uh, through an, uh, an algorithm. And here, it's, it's, not, it's not a particularly useful object. It's purely just to, um, to test the, the, the ability of the, 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 the various parameters that we've learned over the years. And here, they are, again, glazed and fired. And here, I wanted to show you this. This here is meant to be white. This is a white glaze, this is black glaze. And here, you can see the pink bit. So we learned that this is something called migration. So in the kiln, the glazes get so hot that, you know, that, that it vaporizes the minerals and it's able to travel within the kiln into another, onto another object and changes the color of this. Yeah, it's this kind of unpredictability that, you know, is really exciting. But also, RCA would never allow one to do something like this because they are so worried about contamination. So we are just breaking all the rules um, just because sometimes we, we're just from pure ignorance. Um, but it's the, the fun part. And this is also to show you that the pieces are in fact able to join together uh, between uh, once they are fired and the geometry continues uh, between the, the pieces. And here we, uh, we worked with another uh, technique using the robot, which is called incremental sheet uh, forming. It's very thin aluminum sheets that are pushed into very, very slowly. And uh, to do that, uh, we looked into um, this particular factory that makes the um, bullet train um, in Japan for Shinkansen. And here, uh, pieces of metal are pre-CNC cuts and pushed into and folded So this was the 
work in progress show at the RCA. So I want to just very, very quickly say something. At the RCA, there is a, something called the Live Project, where it's a competition for the fourth year students of each studio would, uh, a live project would be set up and each studio would create a mega proposal and uh, the winning project would actually be built. So the first year teaching there, we, we won the, this project, which is just uh, it's to create a new facade uh, on, um, and, on a regeneration project uh, working with the local manufacturer. So it's basically a series of uh, windows uh, that can be used uh, in, as, a, as a display case, but also as a place where one can uh, inhabit. So this is it uh, built. Uh, I wanted to show this because um, with, we, with this, we looked at, we, know, we visited many, many factories and we, in, ceramic factories in Spain and in France. And we wanted, to, for this year, for the light project, we didn't care what the brief was, we just wanted to make a ceramic project. So, um, I'm going to show you, so, so basically, we decided that this is the team this year, and we propose a kind of a fragmented uh, column that, uh, uh, for a site uh, in South London. But, just by sheer luck, the site that they gave us was the ex-production uh, site of Royal Dalton, which was, very, uh, which was a very important uh, ceramic uh, manufacturer in the 19th century. So it was perfect. So, and we won. So this was uh, the, the test that, uh, that they did, and this is one of the components that they produced. But, uh, and also, with all the, uh, the, the traveling we did with the help of Dara Foundation, we did a small exhibition at the embassy, Jap Japanese embassy. Um, I'm going to show you a, just a, a small film about the ceramic project. That's why I didn't talk about it. But before I do that, I wanted to show you just a couple of slides. There's three more slides left. This one is very important, which is... Um, there's a lot going on, you know, the last few years at the farm, and students were given freedom to do whatever they want. They can work whenever they want. They have access to the machines. They, you know, they, 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 um, um, they are not a supervisor as such, but this is not going to be the case. We had a little accident recently, and the student uh, lost a bit of his finger. So, these practical uh, uh, concerns are real part of the evolution of the workshop. And I always knew that the risk was there. And I always knew that this is not, uh, uh, you know, it's not playing. And, uh, you know, with all these changes that's, you know, I've always opened to changes, but now, there's a lot uh, that the school wants imposed on the farm. And I'm not sure how we're going to um, continue. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. But I'm going to have to think about this more carefully. But, so I'm going to end with this little short film uh, for, uh, for, the, for the project in uh, the south of London, that hopefully will be built in a couple of years. It's really, really exciting.
And through that zone, they can't you feel the undulations of her curvature? Oh, oh. yes, yes. The, 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 that slight groan sometimes that some people have in the afternoon before I see that. Just around the corner is an animal that has a strange relationship with the history of the animal. In the mid 13th century, King Henry III had a zoo in the Tower of London, and people would marvel at the sight of a polar bear fishing for so many heads. The river became so dirty so quickly that it became impossible for this bear to fish anymore. Saved London and were exhibited in this pavilion in the Great Exhibition. And these are the ceramic pipes manufactured by Royal Bolton and Nether that saved London from its sewage problem. Thank you. 
Sound Office, we have guys who know how to plant their wings and to get elected by people and their skills. It's quite a big thing, I think, to develop uh, the story and other narrative as well, the placemaking. I think we sort of hit upon the pottery ceramic thing almost like it was a kind of dirt obviously thing. Kind of quite late in the day, you have to put one up to create pottery building. That kind of thing. <laughs> and then there were very, very few people who could make that. Then we weren't sure that needed to kind of move into put it on like really that rapidly. Yeah, I think we're going to have to have a bit of a look at the other pieces of the pottery and see what they Thank you very much.